all hear me. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this uh, seminar to talk about cognitive and affective factors and math performance. Uh, my name is Johan Korhonen and I come from Åbo Academy University, Finland. Uh, and my background is in uh, special education and uh, educational psychology. And uh, I aim to talk about 45 minutes, 50 minutes perhaps. Uh, and then we hopefully have, have time for some, some questions and discussions. Uh, I could still check with Theo. Uh, you are hearing me, right? So that yeah, I yeah, all, all is good. Yes, good. Just say if there is there is something that if there is something with the with the big picture or or with my sound. So yes, but uh, if we first see the outline, what I how I thought that we could proceed. Uh, so first, I will uh, situate uh, the research we have been doing in, in different research group on cognitive factors and math performance. So first, look a bit uh, broader about what do we know about the relationship between some com cognitive factors and math performance. And after that, we, we go to the more affective factors and math performance and, and what, what do we know about them. And then uh, we will look at the interplay between cognitive and affective factors or on math performance. Uh, and then I, in the end, have a bit of some thoughts that uh, what, what could be done in the future and, and what we are like planning to do in, in our current research projects to advance our understanding on, on these mechanisms that underlie these relationships. And um, if we start, well, we could say that it's of course uh, out of the scope of these presentations to go through every possible cognitive and affective factor that might influence math performance. So I have like narrowed it down a bit so that I will, will talk about some like key, key predictors or, 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 or those factors that have been found to be quite uh, clearly related to, to math performance based on like previous research. And if we start with the cognitive factors. So I have decided to, to focus here on uh, uh, working memory and executive functions and uh, magnitude processing. So we, we can think about these as uh, working memory and executive functions are, well, they are like closely related and they are more domain general skills. So they are influencing also other academic uh, areas than just mathematics, while magnitude processing is more like um, a domain specific skill that specifically uh, is useful when doing math. And uh, if we look on the previous research, what we broadly know about the relationships of these cognitive factors and, and math performance. Uh, so there, there is quite a lot of research on working memory and executive functions. And uh, generally, research usually find uh, a, a quite like moderate to strong relationships between working memory, executive functions and, and math performance. And there has also been uh, research on different sub skills of, of math performance and, and, and quite often they are, they are related also to working memory and executive functions. And uh, these relationships have been like studied cross-sectionally and also uh, in longitudinal designs where we have measure where executive functions of working memory have been measured 
at T1 and then uh, they, they have been allowed to predict math performance at later time points. And then there have also been studies that have uh, uh, looked at if working memory or executive functions can predict growth in, in math performance. Uh, but those studies are, 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 are fewer, uh, but there are some. And uh, mostly they have been done with some kind of overall math performance measure. So not different sub skills have been studied in, in that detail. So that is something that we, we have in our studies, one study looked at more closely. So we will look at that in a little while. And uh, then about magnitude processing. So our ability to, to process numbers and quantities, uh, they have been shown to be uh, quite reliably also related to, to math performance and different sub skills in, in cross-sectional studies. Uh, and the same way as with working memory and executive functions, magnitude processing has also been found to predict later math performance. Uh, but uh, here there isn't much studied on the, if magnitude processing can predict growth in, in, in math skills. So that is also some area that hasn't been studied, studied that much. And uh, if we now move a bit to, to the things that we have done with, with our research gr group on, on on working memory executive functions and, and magnitude processing. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, we, we collected data in, in South Africa and uh, we, we measured early numeracy skills. Uh, these are grade one children and we measured their early numeracy skills and uh, then some background information and then also their language skills and their executive function skills. And uh, in this study, we, we basically replicated previous findings in that we found that executive functions were related to, to all three sub skills in this early numeracy test. So we had the sub skills, uh, uh, mathematical relational skills, counting skills and uh, arithmetic skills. Uh, the, the contribution for, for this study to the literature was more that we, we were in a uh, less studied educational environment. And then that we also could show that, that many factors were in, in a model where we have quite a lot of predictors. We, we still found many like significant predictors for early numeracy skills. So it wasn't just the executive function or it wasn't just language, but there were many things that that, that played a role. Uh, and then of course, that in, in this, we, we found that the executive functions had quite, quite similar strengths of relationships to different sub skills of, of early numeracy skills. Uh, but then we continued this study. Uh, here we had uh, about 440 first graders in this cross-sectional data. And then, then this study continued that we also followed some of these children up and, and they did, some of them also did an intervention. And, uh, and that study we, we got published here just, uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, and here we, for, for this study, it was, of, or, or this talk, it's of course most interesting this about executive functions. Uh, and uh, I have here the, the latent growth curve model where we have modeled uh the development of of children's counting skills over three time points and uh, at uh between time point one and time point two uh some of these children did did an did did get an intervention on early numeracy skills but but if we the interesting part here if we think about cognitive factors and math was that we we were we had the possibility to investigate if 
executive functions, we already saw that it was executive functions could uh, was related to, to the same time, but cross-sectionally with early numeracy skills. So, so now we had the opportunity to look if executive functions could also predict the growth in, in, in these early numeracy skills. And for uh, mathematical relational skills, executive functions only predicted the intercept. So it was this, just the cross-section or the, the, the starting point that was measured at the same time as executive functions, but not the, the growth in mathematical relational skills. So, so executive functions seem to give an advantage. Those children who had better executive functions had a better start. So they started in average with higher early number mathematical relational skills, but then the development uh, they didn't get get an advantage of their early uh, executive functions for for the growth in in mathematical relational skills. Uh, but then in counting skills, we observed that <coughs> executive functions also predicted uh, the slope. Uh, so we have a, a significant path here from executive function to the slope, and and slope is of course the the, the, the latent growth of, of counting skills. So, so here we see that the executive functions was a bit differently related to, to different sub skills. Uh, and of course, if we think about them, what are we doing when we are doing a task in with mathematical relational skills? So in, in this measure that we used, uh, it's about comparing quantities and numbers and number concepts a lot. So, so a bit same as you could say number sense or number processing is included there. And, and these kind of comparisons, they, they, they might not need that much of <coughs> executive function uh, skills in that way. But then compare, if you compare to counting skills in counting, you usually have to like more focused and you have to like, like you use more, more of, of these kind of executive function resources. So, so the, 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 it's quite, quite logical in that way that we, we find this kind of, uh, of relations. Uh, then, then we also have, uh, if I go more now to, to magnitude comparison, uh, we have an on, ongoing project in, in Norway with, with some colleagues. And, and there we have also grade one children and then we have followed up then. And, and unfortunately this COVID pandemic ha has, has made life hard to collect data. So we have not been able to collect as many time points as, as, as we had planned. Uh, but this is data before the, the outbreak. And uh, there we have uh, measured symbolic magnitude comparison or symbolic magnitude processing uh, and also arithmetic skills and, and then mathematics anxiety. And I, I think I will come back to the math anxiety when we talk about the affective factors more, but if we now focus on, uh, on the uh, magnitude processing, so we see here that this um, uh, SNMP here, this is a, a latent change model. So, so we see that we have arithmetic skills at time point one, and then we have the, the change score between time point two and time point one. So, so you could think about this a bit like the slope in a latent growth curve model. So here we intercept slope, intercept slope, intercept slope. And uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing here, when we see, uh, if we think about magnitude comparison and math performance, that how, how, how the, do these predict each other or relate to each other and, and, and in what way? So, to our knowledge, I haven't, we haven't seen other studies that have actually like modeled the, the growth parameters in, in arithmetic skills and symbolic uh, magnitude processing. So, so it was really interesting to see what we could find. 
and here we see that the the correlation between growth in arithmetic skills and growth in symbolic uh, magnitude comparison is is quite quite sub substantial so so it's like 0.50 so that means that uh, growth in when you do if you get better in arithmetic you probably also get better in, in symbolic magnitude comparison so so the growth is related so growth in one one area is great is also related to growth in the other area and uh, of course uh, in in time point one they were quite uh, they had quite high correlations also arithmetic skills and, and symbolic magnitude comparison and here we measured this uh, symbolic magnitude comparison with the SYMP test that was uh, is developed by Bert Desmet research group. So, so here basically the children are asked to on paper and pencil to, to choose the, the larger number of two numbers. And then there's a columns with these number comparisons and then they have to like tick the, the bigger number as fast as possible. And do as many as 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 they as they have time in thirty seconds. Uh, and arithmetic skills it was addition and subtraction uh, timed tasks, and then also from the whisk uh, a couple of one task. I don't now remember exactly which one it was, but but it was one that was more like arithmetic. So so that was the the sub task that that were used to create these latent variables here. Yeah, so, so it was, uh, yeah, and one, one side note here that I think it's interesting, even though I don't have any, any good explanations here, uh, we see that we also model gender in the model. And interestingly, gender was like related to magnitude comparison in that way that, that girls had a bit of a higher magnitude processing at T1 and also had a little steeper growth in magnitude comparison. So that was quite interesting to see because we have actually seen the same, same effect in, in another data set from, from Finland and, uh, and that's the other thing that I, I thought that it would be interesting to look at. And this is, um, uh, this is an on ongoing project. It's, uh, it's combined research and development project in that sense that we are developing a new uh, assessment battery to measure mathematical skills. And uh, we have been doing, working with that project from in, in Oh, how this is like the fifth year I think that's starting now so so it has been a long process and uh, we have had last year the opportunity to collect data on on the first part of our functional numeracy assessment that is a, a screener we, we call it like the the FUNA DB so the FUNA dyscalculia battery so it measures basic numerical skills uh, and we, we collected data on 4,265 students in, in Finland with this measure. And um, uh, a little background. So this measure is, uh, is aimed to be a, a, a digital or online measure and, and free, of course, to use for teachers. And uh, it's also aiming to, to be used from grade three to grade nine. So it's quite a, a, a long age span that we are aiming to, to use this measure on. And of course, that, that makes some challenges in, in developing the, the items. And um, <clears throat> so we have been piloting it quite a lot and, do, and, and put a lot of work in this. Uh, but we are quite a big group thinking about these things. So we have Pirjo Aunio and Airi Hakkarainen and Anu Laine from the University of Helsinki. We have Pekka Räsänen, who has been like developing most of the assessments in mathematics used in Finland before already. 
and and then we have um, we have from the University of Turku the uh, the center of uh, learning analytics with us who have like provided the, the like the more the, the technical solutions so that we can we can make these uh, tests so that they work online with both a tablet and a computer and, and so on. And then we have also other, uh, some other other researchers with us that we are also collaborating now with the the, the next next phase of the assessment batteries or next next like test batteries that we are planning are like more like uh, comprehensive, uh, math skill measures that measure like rational number skills and uh, uh, percentages and uh, geometry and probability and statistics and so on. So there we have a lot of experts working with us with, with those tasks. Uh, but if we look just uh, shortly on this one, uh, uh, we have uh, this uh, classic number comparison so choose the larger number then we have uh, digit dot matching uh, then we have a uh, number series uh, then we also have tested this uh, ordinal reasoning task and i was really excited on this one but uh, it turned out that in the pilot when we collected data this didn't work as we had hoped so uh, we, we have to modify it. It was a bit too hard we, we see, but because we have like the options that the students had to look at the numbers 12, 34, 97, and then uh, see if they were in a, uh, how do you say, grow, growth order or, or uh, increasing or decreasing order or mixed order. So if they were in increasing or decreasing, then it was a yes. So it's yes. But if it was not decreasing nor increasing, then it was a no. So, so there were like three, three possible options, but only like two ans possible answers. So, so I think that was the thing that messed things up. So we have to make it a bit simpler. And uh, then we have these classic also addition and subtraction tasks that were timed. And, uh, the, the factor model for, for the data, it works quite well. And uh, it, it turns out to be that there are the, it's two factor solution that describes the measure best. So these two first tasks, they, they load on the same factor. So we are thinking that it's, it's some kind of magnitude comparison factor or number sense. And then we have, uh, the four other tasks are all loading on the same factor. So more like arithmetic skills factor. So, so we are quite happy that those um, key, key, key skills that usually are, are like found in the literature to be quite good indicators for mathematical learning difficulties. So they, they are like com coming out in the, in the factor model here. Our correlation in the whole sample is, is quite strong. And I also put here the latent correlations by grade and uh, they are a bit smaller, but, but still, still quite, quite sub substantial in, in, a, in a way that they are in the moderate range, uh, even, even strong. Uh, and we have also done multi-group CFRs here to look that the, if the measure works in a similar way in all these grades, and actually it, it does. So, so it, it's quite uh, nice to see that, that we, can, we have now a measure that works similarly in all these grades. So we can also use this measure, for example, in longitudinal studies. We haven't done that yet, but it, it's like planned. So it will be interesting. Then we can look more closely, for example, on, on these questions about magnitude processing and arithmetic skills, how they are related to each other over time. Uh, which one is predicting the other, or is it reciprocal? And how is the growth? Are they correlated? And, and so on. So, but but it will that the future will 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 show that. But it, but it has been really interesting to work with this this measure. So uh, now, if uh, uh, I move from from the cognitive factors to the more affective factors, and and with 
affective factors, I, I, I try to like come up with, a, think about a, a concept that would like encompass both motivational factors and emotional factors. So here we, I have chosen to focus on, uh, on self-concept, interest and uh, mad anxiety, mostly. And uh, if we look at uh, these motivational and emotional factors, uh, there is evidence that they are related to, to mind performance. So, so there are meta-analyses which are so shown that self-concept is, uh, oh, oh, here I should say that self-concept is like a hierarchical multidimensional construct. So, so it, it matters a bit what kind of self-concept we are talking about. So, so of course, most uh, strongly related to math is math specific self-concept, of course. And then academic self-concept is overall is also related to math. And, and, but if we talk more about math self-concept, we, we, we see quite clear that they, it's strongly related to, to math performance. Uh, but then if we look at the like uh, the longitudinal relationships, the results are a bit mixed. It seems that the reciprocal model works or fits the data best, at least with older children. But then with younger children, it, it seems that uh, it's more the math performance, math skills that drive the self-concept development. Uh, and then uh, with interest, it's a bit uh, weaker results. There are many studies that don't, don't find in longitudinal designs, so, for example, uh, uh, a connection between interest and, and performance. So many times we'll see that interest can be indirectly through effort related to, to math performance. Uh, and then finally, math anxiety, we, we, we see uh, uh, like, quite reliable relationship cross-sectionally and, and a, a negative relationship, of course. Uh, but here, uh, concerning math anxiety, it's even more unclear how the longitudinal relationships look like, because they have, there are really many, many mixed results from longitudinal studies. So there, there are studies that have found that it's reciprocal. Then there are studies who have found that it's mainly math anxiety that affects performance, but not the other way around. And then there is the opposite that, that has studies that have found that it's math performance that predicts uh, subsequent math anxiety. So, so there is a lot of, of work to do for us researchers in, in that area. Uh, another note here on affective factors is that there seems to be uh, more uh, how, contextual factors that influence these affective factors and also influence their relationship with performance. So I have just highlighted a couple of these uh, uh, models that are used to explain these, these interesting contextual factors. So, so the first one there that you see uh, here uh, is the big fish little pond effect that um, works in that way that uh, school average ability or classroom average has a effect on individual student self-concept. So, so this is quite interesting in, in that way that if we have like two students with similar levels of self-concept and ability, because ability and self-concept are, are linked strongly, but then the one of the students this is in a high ability classroom and or high achievement classroom, and the other one is a lower is in a lower one. So these uh, social comparisons with other people or other students do that if you are in a high achieving class, then, then that has a negative effect on your, your own uh, mathematical self-concept. So, so that's an interesting mechanism that also has an influence here, how these effective factors are interplaying with performance. Uh, this has been mainly studied with self-concept. Uh, there are some studies on, on interest, but they are a bit mixed. Uh, 
And then we, there has recently been also an interest in emotional variables and this big fish little pond effect. That can it be like uh, present also with these kind of of variables? And and that is something that we have been looking at in in one study. And then another one of these more con contextual uh, factors, and this is more about uh, cross-domain comparison. So this uh, internal-external frame of reference model. So that uh, that uh, refers to that we, when when we our self-concept is forming, we also always uh, evaluate how good we are, for example, in math, and that drives our math self-concept. But then we also uh, do an, a comparison cross domainly or like internal comparison in that sense that we we compare our own math performance to for example our reading performance so so we are like doing a decision in which area we are like better or stronger so if we are thinking that we are more like good in math so we have good math performance and then our math self concept is high uh then, then this that we are good in math will actually have a negative relationship to our reading self-concept because we 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 humans tend to we like to compare us to other people and also do comparisons within us so that we 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 are more inclined to like think that okay i'm a more of a math person or i'm more of a language person Although if we look at correlations between the, the skills themselves, they are highly correlated. Students who are good at math tend to be good at reading, for example. But, but the self-concepts in both domains are much more, they have weaker correlations. So that's the idea with the internal external framework of reference model. And, and we haven't there, there we have implemented we had a hypothesis that this one could explain some results in one of our studies so i, I thought that i would uh start oh i'm not starting with that they were in the other order so this is first just a, about one of of contextual factors in general uh where we looked at um, achievement emotions so so achievement emotions are like emotions that students experience in, in, in a specific subject, they are like more reliably measured if they are subject specific and we have measured math achievement emotions. Uh, and here we have looked at uh, more specifically on math achievement emotions in lower secondary students, uh, about 1400 uh, in Finland. And uh, here we were interested to see if the emotions of students receiving special education support in mathematics uh, varied as a function of, of their how they got their special education support. And also if this kind of if getting special education in 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 separate special classes or getting it in inclusive education, inclusive classrooms with, with other students, what kind of effect it has on your emotions towards math for the special education so students, but also for these students who are in these classrooms with, with students who need much additional support. So, so we looked at, at, at these, these aspects. And uh, here is now an, a lot of numbers, but I'm just like telling you in general what, 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 what the main findings were. So mainly you could say that students with, who, who received special education support in mathematics in inclusive classrooms, they had more like less favorable achievement emotions in mathematics compared to uh, average or students not receiving special education, but also uh, they had more negative emotions than those students who received special education in special classes. So they, they had generally experienced less enjoyment, less pride, more anger, more anxiety, more shame, more hopelessness. And interestingly also, 
these students who got special education support in special classes also experienced actually more enjoyment and more pride, less anger, less anxiety, less shame, uh, less anxiety, and less hopelessness than than average students. Of course, here in these analyses, uh, we controlled for mathematical performance so that it wasn't just that that would explain the results. So, so that we have to keep in mind. But still, when we are controlling for math performance, we, we get these kind of results. Uh, this was done uh, with uh, single level analysis because uh, students we in special classes, they form their own like classes. So, so we didn't do a multi-level model here. But then uh, we did multi-level models to compare more closely uh, students who got support and were in inclusive classrooms versus those who do not get special education support in the same classroom. So we had, we modeled it on the students nested within classrooms to see a bit about the variance and the effects on the individual level and the classroom level. And more, more importantly, we wanted to look that is the inclusion of students who receive special education support can it has some impact on their fellow students in the classroom, on their achievement emotions? And, and the thing that we found was that it actually has in, in some areas. So we, we found that in classroom where the proportion of students with receiving special education support was higher, in those classes, uh, all students experienced more anxiety and more hopelessness and more boredom. Uh, and we have we, we thought about what, what could like be some possible explanations and 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 we, we think that that mainly it, it probably is a is a matter of resources in that sense that if we have a lot of students who need special education support in inclusive classrooms uh, it might be that the uh, math teacher in this classroom doesn't get any ad additional resources to deal and, and help these students. So, so we have a teacher who doesn't have enough resources. So it and has to put a lot of uh, time on these students who, who need, need extra support. So of course there can be that the whole class room they, the other students don't get uh, as much attention as they would need. So the hopelessness and could increase, anxiety could increase, and also the boredom could increase if, if, if the teacher has to like help a lot these students who are struggling and then other, other students have to a bit wait, wait on them. So, so that was quite interesting re results there. Uh, then about the big fish little pond effect, uh, there was, uh, we tested this in the same sample as, as that we, I just showed. Uh, and we also find, uh, but the big fish little pond effect on, on one emotion, but not all these emotions. So it was mainly uh, pride that was uh, affected by the big fish little pond effect. So in, in high achieving classroom students in general uh, experience less pride than in classrooms with, with, with lower achievement. Uh, but uh, uh, then there were some interesting uh, cross-level interactions because we, we also looked at if, if this big fish little pond effect varies as a function of math performance. And there we, we saw some interesting results so that uh, for lower performing students experienced more pride and shame in, in classrooms with higher average achievement. And then also the high performing students, they, they experience uh, less enjoyment and more boredom in, in higher achieving classrooms. So that was also a bit interesting that you would think that high performing students would be 
enjoy more to be in high achieving classrooms. So, so that was a bit of interesting. And, but, and, but here we got the other results. And then we also got some results that male experience more shame than females or boys more than girls. Uh, about the internal and external frame of reference model, uh, we, we had that in mind when we, when we like designed this study and, and then did the, like looked at the, the, the analysis. And now this is a quite a lot of variables in the model. And, and for this talk, it's more like interesting about the, the internal external frame of reference model. And, and in this model, if you, for example, look here at, hope you can see my, my pointer here. But if you look at the model below the girls model, you see that if we just fastly looked at what's in the model, you see that we have a math path here in the, in the upper end of the model. So we have math performance predicting math self-concept that predicts math interest. And then we have a reading path in the lower end of the model. We have reading performance predicting reading self-concept that predicts reading interest. And then we have outcome measures, we have aspirations, and we have uh, math related occupational aspirations. So we have, we ask the students about uh, that when they are 30 years old, what kind of work would they like to be doing? And then we used uh, some uh, database that, that was, uh, that is, I don't remember the name now, but it's in the article. Where, where you can like look, for example, grade how, uh, there's grade and how much math do you need for a certain job on a scale from zero to hundred. So we, we had, we could like put points on all the, all the, all the occupa different occupations the students were saying that they wanted to do. So we, we graded them for their math score. And then we also graded the, the, the same occupations for the reading involved the reading score there. And then in the middle, we have educational aspirations, but it's just about what's the highest level you would like to achieve, or educational level, and what's the highest educational level you think you will achieve. So both idealistic and realistic. So we had three outcomes. And, and the main idea here about the internal external frame of reference model was that we, we were thinking that because we know that there is some differences between boys and girls about math and reading, that boys tend to be more positive against math and choose math related occupations compared to girls more, more frequently. So we were hypothesizing that because we know that the internal external frame of reference model that find these negative cross domain relationships, we thought that it might be that in this kind of model, we would find these cross negative cross loadings that could explain some of the differences between boys and girls. Uh, we didn't find a lot of them. We actually did only find, I think, uh, uh, one, one negative cross loading and that was that reading self-concept for girls was negatively related to math related uh, occupational aspirations. Uh, so, so that means basically that, that if a girls thought that they were really good at reading, they were less likely to choose a math related occupation. But this, this negative cross loadings, we did not find them for boys. Uh, and on a side note, it was interesting to see that it was mainly only the math path that predicted boys aspirations, while for girls, it was like, reading self-concept that had effects and math interest and also math performance here to, to reading related occupational aspiration. That was a bit of a, a cross domain finding, but it wasn't negative, it was actually positive. So it, it was a bit interesting here. But I have to move on now because I, I see that I, I will be in a hurry in the, in the end. Uh, here is about math anxiety and longitudinal relations between uh, math anxiety and math performance. And here is the same model we looked at a little while ago when we looked at magnitude comparison. We also modeled change in math anxiety from time point one to time point two. So it's from grade one to grade two. And 
the interesting here is that we also here find uh, a negative relationship between growth or change in math anxiety and growth change in arithmetic skills. So it's negative. So a, a better, steeper growth in, in, in arithmetic skills is related to, to less increase in math anxiety. And a, a steeper increase in math anxiety is related to less arithmetic skills growth. So it was quite interesting finding to, to see that, that the, the growth in both, both factors are related. Uh, this one I, I will talk more in the end on, on, on what we are like planning for because this project hasn't started the data collection yet. Uh, and then we, we also have, have one data set where we have several time points for, for lower secondary and upper secondary students. And there we have also measured math anxiety and math skills. So we, this, this isn't like published or anything and we still, we have just done the preliminary analysis with manifest variables to look at how, how does the data look like. Uh, but we are planning here to do it with, with uh, using latent variable modeling for the anxiety. The, the math measure here is like based on an IRT, item response theory model. So, so it will not in that way be, be, be a, like a classical latent, but, but still we will do it in a, in a, in a same framework. And then, then we will also, because recent advances in, in methods had shown that this traditional this kind of, uh, of cross, cross lagged regression models that they, they might be need to, to specify them a bit differently to get more reliable results. So that is something that we will start, uh, are planning to, to do the analysis a bit better. But here in this preliminary results, we, we see uh, quite clearly at, at the moment, at least it looks using only these manifest variables that the relationship between math anxiety and math performance would be reciprocal, more or less. So we see that, that there are significant cross, cross lag regression paths. Here is from time point three performance to time point four anxiety. This wasn't significant, but at all other were. So, so it, it, it seems a bit that they would be reciprocal, these, these relations, but we'll see when we have the time to do the analysis better to, to see what, what we really find here. Uh, and interesting if we think about what, why, why would anxiety affect performance or the other way around. Uh, this has been of course studied before a lot and also not just mad anxiety, but anxiety in general and test anxiety and, and so on. And, and there is this, um, one theory, this attentional control theory, that would that fits quite well with the with the notion that anxiety would would have a negative effect on performance, and and according to that theory, it would be that anxiety mainly taxes working memory resources, that again makes the task performance to do be a bit uh, less good. Uh, but then, of course, we also have these uh, paths from math performance to anxiety, and and that that's they they wouldn't like fully be accounted for in in this attentional control theory. So there has been like uh, posited that that it's mainly because if you have low math performance, you start to avoid math, and that decreases your, of course, in the long run, also your math self concept. And, and, and this like effect that you avoid math, you feel that you are not good at math, that increases your anxiety for math. So, so, so there is, uh, according to that view, it would be mainly that we would find effects from, from prior performance to subsequent anxiety. So, so here, here the research is not like quite, uh, in agreement and the previous results, as I said, have has find a bit different results. But I still think that the most prominent view is that at least anxiety should uh, affect working memory 
which in turn then, then makes task performance worse. And here we like, if we think about working memory and anxiety, then we, we come to the, to the last, last part about the cognitive and affective factors interacting in some way on performance. And uh, here I will like mainly now focus on mad anxiety and or test anxiety also, because uh, that's the thing that we have been looking at ourselves a bit and, and have plans to do, do more research on. So as I already say, this prominent view is that mad anxiety hampers math performance by depleting working memory resources needed to perform the, the, the math tasks. Uh, and, and also about this topic, there's a quite good book chapter recently that came out about uh, that discuss a lot about working memory, math, anxiety, test anxiety. And uh, if we look at the literature, we, we, we find evidence that indeed working memory mediates the relationship between test anxiety or math anxiety uh, on, on math performance. So, so th this is quite, uh, we have done one study where with grade three children and we found this uh, mediation effect. Uh, but more like interesting, I think is the moderation effect because that is also been found in, in, in previous research. And, and the interesting thing here is that it actually have been like, uh, also here there have been like different results in different studies. Uh, so for example, in many math anxiety studies, for example, in, in Ramirez uh, studies, they have usually found that um, if we, we divide our students into those with higher working memory capacity and those with lower working memory capacity, that the math anxiety hampers the high working memory group performance more than the low working memory group's performance in math. So you would suffer more from anxiety if you have good work or high working memory. But then there are other studies that have found the opposite pattern in this interaction effect. So that we see that those with high working memory, so they are affected a little about, uh, a little if they experience anxiety, but then it's more the uh, lower perform or low working memory students who suffer more from anxiety. And, and this view would, at first glance, we would think that this is more in line with the attentional control theory. If we think that anxiety depletes your resource, working memory resources. So those with high working memory resource, resources, so they would lose only a little. So their performance is not hampered that much, but those with little in the beginning, so low working memory capacity, and then anxiety comes, then it takes almost everything. But uh, these like results have been like explained uh, by the help that uh, uh, those students who have higher working memory capacity, they use more advanced strategies when solving problems. And, and Ramirez or, and, and colleagues, they also showed that these strategies could mediate the relationship between anxiety and performance. So, so it supports their idea and, and, and gives an explanation to those results. Uh, and uh, we have been thinking a lot because we got uh, this result to the right. That's not in the other direction than Ramirez. And, uh, and we also did in, in that study looked at the different math tasks and we found the interaction effect on the overall math performance. And we used the national, national test in mathematics in grade three in Sweden. And we, then we, we, had the, we got item level data also. And then we looked at only like basic arithmetic skills and the same model. And there we also find the interaction effect similarly. But then when we use problem solving items that are more like, uh, that require more, more working memory, uh, we did not find an interaction effect. We found that, that 
all st- students that anxiety like had an effect on them, but it wasn't like moderated by working memory. Uh, and so, so we thought that probably the, the differences in these studies is that uh, Ramirez and uh, colleagues, they used like problem, math problems or math tasks that require a, quite a lot of working memory also. And then it would be like plausible that those who are high achieving or have high working memory uh, and have math anxiety that their performance will drop. And those with low working memory, it might be that from the beginning, they, even though they don't have anxiety, they don't necessarily have, are not that successful in solving those tasks. And the same way we, in our study, we thought that probably that we find the interaction effect is that students with low working memory capacity usually have like, are, are lower achieving in math. And we know that students with math difficulties tend to use more counting based strategies in basic arithmetic. So that means that uh, they use strategies that require more working memory resources in these basic arithmetic skills. While high performing students, they just use fact retrieval, which isn't that intensive for, for working memory or other memory based that would, would be more smoother. So, so we, 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 our hypothesis is that we, we probably see an effect depending on which kind of strategies the students are using and what kind of we, working memory load that would like impose on them. And, and that aligns also with the, with the study of uh, NG, N, NG, I, I can't pronounce that correctly, and Lee, uh, where, where they like with an experimental design found that the, uh, if the, that the working memory load moderated the relationship between test anxiety and task performance. So that high working memory load was, was, uh, was more detrimental for, for students with, with high test anxiety on, on task performance. So, so, so that, that's something that we have now like think about that how could we like tease these possible uh, effects out. So, so we are like in one project planning to, to measure uh, in an experimental design this more more specifically these strategies for students so that we could see if we find this one interaction effect that that looks more like like on the right side for 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 low working memory capacity students in basic arithmetic tasks because they use these less efficient strategies and then we would find this kind of interaction perhaps on more problem solving tasks. That's at least the thing that we, we think we, we could find. Uh, and now I, I see I have, I have talked a bit over what I was thinking about talking, but, but I think we still have time to, to 10, 15. So I'm just saying some words here in, in the end of these uh, thoughts on, on the way forward. And uh, I just listed here things that I have that, that if we think about previous results and, and what we don't yet know and what's a bit unclear and so on, I'm thinking about the pathways from anxiety to performance. And the thing that some studies stu studies found reciprocal re re relationships and others find other, other results. So. Uh, I think that we can measure quite reliably this trait anxiety in, in these kind of designs, but it would be, I think, to understand a bit more about the mechanism, how anxiety like, how it develops during when you are experiencing problems in math or, or, or situations with, with math and, and, and so on. I, I was thinking it would be really interesting like to, to collect more like some, like this experience sampling data. So we would collect during math lessons, several measurement points within lessons, within weeks and within students so that we like could tease more about what happens there in the classrooms. And then we would of course measure some baseline measures and, 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 and endpoint measures that would be more like traditional, but we would have this intensive longitudinal data so about more or less this kind of state anxiety related to ta math tasks. So that would probably some something would be interesting or use some kind of 
physiological markers. For example, we could conduct skin uh, so that you could use this uh, that measures skin, uh, how much you, you sweat in your hands, for example, as a marker for this kind of state anxiety to tease out the mechanisms that, that, that how, how anxiety really develops in the more, more on the micro level there. And then, of course, intervention and experimental studies and also person-centered analysis w would be interesting to do because I think it, for example, person-centered analysis haven't been done that much in, in math anxiety resources, resor research. And the, one of the advantages with person-centered analysis is that with those we can tease out non-linear effects or non-linear relationships. Because always when we do variable-centered for example, structural equation modeling with path models, we, we usually assume that the relationships are linear, but there might be some kind of subgroups in the data that, that, exp that have other kinds of relationships between these variables. And these person-centered analysis can, can tease effects like that out. And uh, we have a new project that we have started, but. Uh, Unfortunately, our first data collection was to be held this spring, but due to the pandemic, we, we have to like postpone it and hopefully we can do the first measurement next year. Uh, but there we have like a, both, a, we have a longitudinal design that we will start with and then we will, so to look at these relations over time with anxiety and performance in grade three to five. And then we are also thinking of doing an experimental study I was talking about, about the strategies, working memory and anxiety and performance. And then we also have in the last year planning that we will do an intervention aimed at reduce math anxiety. And we will like do it with a retrieval practice paradigm. That's like the idea is that we could make the students feel more confident during the intervention. And that would like have a positive effect on self-concept and that would have a positive effect in reducing anxiety but we will see how, how that goes but now I, I have been talking a bit too much so I think I will I will stop here so that we have time with some some comments or or or, or some questions thank you so thank you Johan for an excellent presentation as always. Um, so now we have like 10 minutes for some questions. If anyone in the audience might have some, you can just raise your hand or write them in the chat if you have something to ask from Johan. Okay, and someone did, okay, go ahead. Um, yes, I was having uh, two questions. Uh, one about the affective factors. Uh, um, there are different parent involvement factors, uh, both mediating and moderating children's affections about math, as well as uh, achievement and performance. And I was uh, wondering if you have been considering or doing any measure uh, measuring about uh, this parent involvement or parent capital uh, like SES uh, factors. And the second question is about uh, the use of the word performance. It was very interesting. Um, uh, and I was wondering if you had some, could say something about the conceptual understanding or theoretical background for using the word of performance instead of achievement or an example of skills or ability that you have used as measurements somewhere? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, about the parents, uh, we have actually in this um, uh, project in Norway uh, measured or have a, had questionnaires to parents about uh, here in, in, in conjunction with these children. So their parents have actually uh, answered some questions about anxiety, math anxiety and how much they help with homework and a bit about other uh, beliefs about mathematics and so on. But uh, we, haven't, we haven't in that data analyzed that part yet, but, but we, there have been some studies in the US that have shown, for example, that 
parents with math anxiety can like uh, transfer their anxiety on their children and and the and the worst part about I think about that was and a really interesting part also but not so good was that those parents who helped more with homework and and experienced math anxiety themselves that effect was stronger to to give math anxiety to their children if they were helping with the homework a lot so so there there, there we see something like that about uh, SES uh, we have like for example we have control for it in in many of our studies in Finland and there hasn't really been been like so any there have been of course those students who come from high SES tend to have a bitter higher achievement but the relationships between these affective factors and uh, and performance we haven't in in those studies found any any differences uh, then the other question, if I understood you, you, you thought about our, uh, that I use math performance as, a, as, a, as the concept and not math skills or, or math achievement. Uh, uh, I, I have to confess, I didn't think about it so much about which one of, of these three I would use. Uh, basically, in, in prior studies, there are like, usually you use quite a lot of, of performance and achievement when we use some kind of overall, overall math ability test, or we use the math grades as an indicator of math performance or math achievement. And then skills we are probably using more frequently in studies that we measure some sub skills of of mathematics so we use for example with arithmetic skills or, or something like that but in that sense i i haven't i have to confess i haven't thought about this in in this instance that much uh about the uh then if i understood you correct about the validity i i i i think that usually it's using overall if i just say about using standardized tests versus grades it's always better to use standardized tests, although in many research these are quite high correlations, but still if we use grades from school, then it's always some kind of subjective judgment for it from the teacher that also is, is like weaved into the, into the grades. Okay, thank you for the answer. We have a few more questions. So Terhi asks, um, do you happen to know whether there have already been any effective interventions on math anxiety and that way math performance? Uh, I am not that for me. We, we actually now are uh, doing uh, with one of my PhD students have started to do a, a systematic literature review on on math anxiety interventions, and uh, but I haven't looked yet so closely exactly how they have looked like uh, most of them but there are are some but the results have been like really really mixed on on those and the retrieval practice that we have for example thinking about using is uh, the basis for that has been that retrieval practice to our knowledge hasn't been used in math anxiety interventions before at least that what that that much that we have looked at but, but but we think that that would be one line of, of work that could could go be, be beneficial at, and many of course of those interventions are all also aimed at increasing math performance and in that like indirectly reducing math anxiety but I, unfortunately i'm not that uh, I haven't had time yet to, to dwell so deep into that area, but hopefully now when 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 the my PhD student get gets more going more forward, I have the opportunity to look at this more closely. But thank you for the question. Okay, then another one asked: Do you think having general anxiety reducing strategies such as breathing and others in the duration of a math class will help? Uh, could you say it again? So reducing anxiety 
So basically, if you have uh, reducing anxiety strategies, such as breathing techniques, uh, yeah. doing the math class, will it help in terms of the anxiety? Uh, it, it could help, I think, if we think about more, more like test anxiety or doing a math, if you have a math exam or math test, because that, that there's like some evidence, for example, that if you get the opportunity to, to write down your thoughts about the upcoming test just before the test and and if you are an anxious individual then that have been shown to to help in the reducing worry and and increase your your test performance so i think that this kind of breathing exercise but this is more like i think that it would could be helpful in in test situations i'm not sure that it in the in the long run I, I'm not like how, how sure that it would help if you always do the breathing before a math class. I, I can't say about that. So, but good question again, <laughs> thanks. Okay, then we have a couple more questions. And the next one is, what is the long-term implication of your research in terms of helping teachers supporting young children's learning maths? Can we, can we also say that an inclusive classroom may not be preferable for children who need special intervention? So there's two questions there. Well, if we think about the, the things we have looked at today, cognitive and effective factors. So I think that, that we should like, at least in, in, in Finland, in, in, in my view, we have like uh, maybe not focused that much in, in teacher education or in-service teacher training about affective factors and math. So this is still a, a topic that, for example, if when, when we ha have had some schooling with, with teachers about math anxiety, that's usually quite a new, new concept and they haven't like heard it, even though that they, they of course, uh, identify, okay, we have had children with this kind of problems but they haven't like reflected on them so I, I think that uh, raising like the knowledge that that you should also consider these affective factors that they are really important also uh, I think that would be the main thing because these cognitive factors are still more well understood in general and and and, and people like tend to to remember them better than and, and know about them better than these affective factors uh, and what was the other one I, I, my Memory Spanish. Yeah, so the second question was that can we also say that an inclusive classroom may not be preferable for children who need special intervention? Yeah, that's of course a really hot topic, and uh, I, and it it has been like it's have many levels. So from a, a like I think from a ideal, ideological point of view, I think we all agree that everyone should be in like teached in the same classrooms, and I don't think every, anyone disagrees on that, but. But then in practice, we also have to think about what, what are the resources available for teachers in school and, and what is the, like the most effective way in, in, in training something. So sometimes I think it's better if we need to give a lot of support that it would be more beneficial to do it in like small group instruction that we also know from intervention studies that they tend to be can be quite effective. But then we have to consider other variables, of course, that how what kind of has this some kind of implications for 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 the development of social skills and stuff like this so so it's it's a balance there are always like pros and cons on, on on this but i think it's from a learning perspective it's like the resources and how can you like organize the teaching in in an effective way okay then we have last two quick questions before we have to move on so um one question was, I'm just curious to know if the language, aka mode of teaching, can also have an effect on numeracy as a learning disability. Mm. So, so if I understood correctly, the, the question is, is, is that if language of instruction, I, I think it, it, it can, of course, if language of instruction is not your native language, I don't, then, then it, gets a problem so so we'll we'll see we see for example in the that south african studies so there were quite many children who had like 
they, they were all these children were taught in English, in English speaking classes, but they came from different uh, homes. And in many homes, there were like African languages that were talked home. And, and we saw that, that the, this kind of language uh, background, of course, um, so they had a slower start at least so that their early numerous skills were slower, for example. And so, so I think definitely if you are like getting the instruction in a, uh, uh, no, no, not, you are not a native speaker in, in that language, then, then it will have, a, have an impact at least in the beginning. Of course, if you are like nine years in school, then in the, then it gets better. You, you, you learn a lot of the other language, but of course in that way, but not, I wouldn't say that it, it, it's like that you will get higher, higher, learn, higher risk of getting learning disabilities in that sense. So it's more like that you have struggle at in the beginning with the learning. Okay, thank you. And then the last one is that, um, have the tests and assessments you have used in your research all been created in Finland? Uh, not, not all, all. But now, now I have to see. Of course, here were so many different ones. But if we just say, like most of the questionnaire, for example, for self-concept, interest, anxiety, many, uh, most of them are like from scales developed in other countries. So we have just like we have translated them. The math skills used. So, so the one we used in. In South Africa was of course that one is developed by Pirjo Aunio and Rikka Mononen here in, in Finland, but it's like it has shares many similarities, for example, with the early numbers test from, from the Netherlands, from one Luit group. And then we had the Bertus Metz magnitude processing test. So but but yeah, many of the math tests we still have done in created in, in Finland, but they are like of course inspired by by many many other previous research. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you for the good questions and even better answers. Um, we are now done for this session and I'm going to put the, uh, the starting special interest group sessions in the chat so everyone can see the links from there. So those will start in 13 minutes. So I will see you all in the special interest group discussions. Thank you, Johan, again and see ya. Bye-bye.